the writer of the book to the Hebrews, says this, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, what on earth does that mean? I've struggled with that bit until I sort of discovered that another sense of belief or faith is trust. So if we put our trust in God, it brings joy to his heart. It puts a smile on his face. It pleases him when we put our trust in him. And that made that verse understandable for me. I have a question for you. When I read the Bible, there is a part of the Bible that makes me very scared. Do you have a bit of the Bible that you read that scares you? No, just me then. And I'd like to share with you about this bit that I find really scary. It's in Numbers 20. Uh, so the Israelites by this time were, were about 38 years in the desert. And they ended up in a place, I think Mariba, that um, there were no water. And again, they complained to Moses and said the usual thing, why did you bring us out to die in this uh, place that doesn't have anything? We and our animals, we would have been better off back in Egypt. So Moses and Aaron went to God, and God said to them, take the staff, the one, and they took the one that's in the Lord's presence. If you go back to Numbers 17, you discover this is Aaron's staff that they should take. And Aaron's staff, if you remember the story right, the people complained again about Aaron being the high priest. So God had them, the, the leaders put all of their staffs before him. And overnight, Aaron's staff uh, sprouted leaves, buds, leaves, and fruit. And I think it was an almond staff, if I remember right. Now that is a picture of resurrection. The staff was dead and now it came to life. So this is the staff that they had to take and then go to the rock and speak to the rock and it will bring forth water and that way God would supply in his needs, in the needs of the Israelites based on the resurrection. And we know the rock is a picture of the Lord Jesus. So God would have supplied in their needs based on the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Whereas Moses' staff was a staff of judgment and condemnation. Because you'll remember all of the plagues, or most of them, came through Moses' staff. And at the Red Sea, when he parted it, after he parted it, and then had a, uh, the sea was, when all of the Israelites went through, and then the sea was closed in judgment on the Egyptians. So his staff represents judgment. And there was an earlier time when the Israelites complained again about not having water. And at that stage, God told Moses to take his staff and hit the rock. And Paul tells us again, this is a picture of the Lord Jesus. So God's judgment, the staff of judgment, hit the rock picture of the crucifixion of Jesus, where God's judgment came upon him, and because his judgment against sin fell on Jesus, and through his finished work, Jesus became the life-giving spirit. He comes into us, and he himself becomes a fountain of life, of living water inside us, of eternal life. So that's a picture of the Lord Jesus being crucified. But 
Then Moses and Aaron did this. They went to the people and the first thing they said, you rebels, you rebellious people. They had lost sight of how God sees Israel. Moses didn't spend one day in slavery. He didn't have any empathy with these people. He didn't know where they were coming from, what they went through. That's why God couldn't make him a high priest. Though he was a, f a friend of God, though he knew, spoke to, with God face to face, he didn't see the Israelites the way that God saw them. Aaron, who went through slavery with the Israelites, that's why he could empathize with them. But he, as high priest, who first needed to bring an offering for his own sin before he could bring an offering of atonement for the sins of Israel, he saw the people as rebels. And it's interesting, later we learn actually how God see, saw Israel because King Balak asked Balaam, a prophet, to curse Israel. And he was taken up onto a mountainside a hill, a side, or a hillside and he looked down on Israel. And when the Israelites camped, they camped in a, what's the shape of a cross. And then God showed Balaam what, he, Balaam what he saw. He says, I have blessed and no one can curse Israel. Two, I don't see any iniquity, nothing wrong in Israel because of what Jesus would one day do for them. That's the way God saw it. But Moses and Aaron, they saw rebellious people. The second thing they did was say, they said this, shall we give you water? God wanted to give the Israelites water. This is, I don't know, to me it feels like arrogance. We will give you water. So they lost sight of how God sees the people and became, I think, spiritually arrogant. Maybe a form of spiritual pride as well, that they take God's place, that they try and provide for the people. And the third thing they did was Moses used his rod of judgment, his staff of judgment, and he struck the rock twice. And that's a bit that scares me, because Moses before the eyes of Israelite, misrepresented a type of Jesus. So what God wanted the people to know about Jesus one day, Moses misrepresented that. And because of that, he and Aaron lost the privilege of bringing the Israelites into the promised land. So I think there's three lessons here and one deeper lesson, if you will. The first thing is when we deal with God's people and we start having problems with them, it might be that we've lost sight of how God sees them. And I always thought the answer to that is that we have to start thinking that Jesus died for them. He paid for their sins. I need to think that way. But I think I have to go a step further back and think about it like what Jesus has done for me and to me, that's what he's done for them and to them. So thinking, yeah, you know, all of those things I've done wrong, all of those sins I've did, or I've done, Jesus has died for that. He has forgiven me. And he's done the same for you and you. And that issue I have with you, 
He's done precisely the same. And that's basically we love as he's loved us. So first realizing how much he loves you or what he's done to you and then applying that to other people. So I think that's maybe the answer there. The second thing about this arrogance, it might be that we come to a point where we lose sight of God and what he wants to do for people. And we try and supply in their needs. Instead of seeing, for example, the church, it's Jesus' body. He's the head of the church. He's responsible for that person, the person that you have an issue with, the person that you have a problem with. He's responsible for them. Trust him. Put your trust in him again. The third thing is more of a personal thing for me, this misrepresentation of Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes and he says, the good news of God about his son Jesus, the gospel, he received from the resurrected Jesus. And that's the gospel, that's the good news he writes about and he preached about. And he writes to the Galatians and he says, even if he himself, Paul, or any other apostle, or anyone else, or even if it were angels, brings a different gospel, a different good news, who changes things about them, this, then they are under a double curse. And this is one thing I've asked God, that I want to know the, his good news about his son. I want to know what he thinks about his son. What is the good news that he wants us to know about his son? And this is what I want to tell people about. Not things that I've learned from other people, but that I've learned from God himself through his word. Because I've been thinking, I've noticed when at work, um, someone is, for example, nasty to one of our nurses, or they slight one of our nurses. It really upsets me. And I'd have a go at that person and have words with them about the way they've been acting to one of our nurses. And they not nurses aren't even family. And I can just think how it must be for God when we slight his son, when we misrepresent his son, how it must hurt him. So I can understand why Paul says, talks about a double curse on people who misrepresent the gospel. The deeper lesson, Moses, the law, can't bring you into the promised land. It can only bring judgment or condemnation. Actually, it's interesting when you read the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the uh, Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, uh, part of the Old Testament. When you get to the book of Joshua, they translate Joshua's name as Jesus in the Greek, Jesus. So any Greek-speaking Hebrew at that stage would have read the book of Jesus and read about Jesus bringing the Israelites into the promised land. So it's only Jesus, our Joshua, that can bring us into God's rest. Not rules, not regulations, just trusting him, the living Jesus. So I guess that's what I have to say, and that's what I thought I'd share with you. Just a little bit about the Bible that scares me, and the scary bit about misrepresenting Jesus. And maybe also that bit about how we can lose sight of what God sees about people, and how we should just be depending on God to let him do his thing for people, based on what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that there is so many lessons. And I'm just thinking of Jesus' words that he even said that anything that's said against the Son of Man, against him, or about him, will also be forgiven. And I can just think how much it hurt your heart when the Jewish leaders rejected your son and mocked him when he hung there on that cross. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing, and that you even carried these sins of theirs. And that you exhausted the judgment against sin and that all that we left now is your Father's love and all of the spiritual blessings in heaven. That they are all ours now. Thank you for such a big love. Amen.